we can perfectly well understand the perspective of our friends on the left. We know why they're freaking out. We know why they're upset. We know why they're worried. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is that they're concerned that the precedents which the court has handed down um, creating these uh, these new doctrines and, and abrogating uh, uh, fundamental rights like the, the the right of the unborn to life and right. legal securities for the health of the mother and the rights of children to be connected to their natural parents. Um, they're concerned that all of those are going to be rolled back. And you're absolutely right that from their perspective, the law or what justice requires is identical to what I believe. Right. Um, and the asymmetry is they can't perceive that we don't view the law that way. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. My next guest is a professor of law at Faulkner University and uh, somebody who's very well respected, done a lot of work in the area of constitutional law, and he's here today to talk to us about the new opening on the Supreme Court. So welcome to the program, Professor Adam McLeod. So thank you so much uh, for being with us here on the program. And uh, if you would just, because of course the, the big news story that is on everybody's mind right now is of course the fact that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the justice that's been there for a very long time, some would argue the most liberal justice on the court, uh, is gone. So if you could just give us a quick rundown of her legacy and what she has meant to the court, what she's meant to uh, just the way that the the nation perceives law, the good and the bad. Well, her legacy, I would say, is very mixed. Um, on one hand, she uh, was an excellent, excellent lawyer mm -hmm. um, in the sense of being an excellent technician of the law. Um, the work that she did before she was on the court, um, she was a very, very competent legal strategist um, who did a lot of work, uh, particularly on women's rights issues. Um, although, you know, one, one might say that a lot of the work she was doing um, as a lawyer was uh, pushing on open doors um, in the sense that a, a lot of the uh, rights that she was securing um, in using a, a litigation for a um, had been more or less set in place by things that had happened decades or even a uh, century earlier with the Married Women's Pr uh, Property Acts and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but she was an excellent, excellent lawyer and used those resources well. Um, she was also, uh, by all accounts, uh, a very personable person and very charismatic. Uh, she famously had a, a, a very robust friendship with the late Antonin Scalia, right. uh, her colleague on the court who uh, was very much a man of the right. Um, and their uh, jurisprudential and ideological differences uh, didn't, uh, it didn't appear to affect their friendship at all. Um, and, and that's very, very admirable. Um, in some ways, she continued her legacy as an excellent technician of the law after being placed on the court. Many cases um, of sort of straightforward statutory interpretation or uh, straightforward uh, adjudication and, um, based on uh, it's well settled law. She did uh, very, very well and wrote very clearly. Um, but of course, on any point on which uh, the law departed from her own, um, we might call them leftist ideological uh, dogmas, um, she tended to be quite lawless. Um, and this, I think, is her lasting legacy for those of us who care about the Constitution. Um, uh, from on, on any number of issues, whether it was uh, the, the constitutional and, and legal limits on the administrative state, um, whether it was social issues such as the definition of marriage or abortion or religious liberty, mm -hmm. um, she, was, she was quite uh, consistently uh, voting uh, without regard to the meaning of the constitution, without the regard to the original uh, meaning of, of federal and state laws. Um, and uh, and really continued throughout her career right up to the very end to push the court further and further uh, toward the left and away from the law um, of the Constitution on, on a number of issues. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really excellent point to bring out, though, that, uh, you know, from a, from a technical sense, she was a, a, a lawyer that believed in the rule of law, but then on certain things she believed that the law meant basically whatever she thought it ought to mean. 
And so uh, that is sort of an interesting dichotomy. I actually saw a tweet yesterday from Representative Ilhan Omar, uh, who said, and, and I guess it was mostly in reference to what's going on in the country now with uh, the riots and everything. She said, uh, I hope that Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy will become a revolution. And I kind of looked at that and I was like, I don't know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg would have wanted that because, yes, yeah, she was very much on the left. But she also was very much a rule of law kind of person. And so could you speak to that for just a second? Yeah, she she wanted to push the law um, and she uh, really pushed the law often without regard to the law. But she she had a conceptual coherence to her jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. It was largely driven by principles of equality of result. Um, and I think she I think she genuinely believed that those principles of equality of result, as opposed to equality under the law or equality of opportunity, which would be an original understanding of expressions that you find, for example, in the Declaration of Independence, that all are created equal and endowed by a creator with certain inalienable rights or the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, as originally understood, those expressions of American political ideals and legal doctrine um, really just mean that uh, we all must be held equal under the law, not that right. the law has to get us all to it to the same place. Um, Justice Ginsburg's view was very much that the law must get us all to the same place, that the law has an active role in bringing about equalities of result. And if we don't have equalities of result, that's a failure of the law. So in, in that sense, her, her jurisprudence was quite consistent. Um, and I think she genuinely believed it. Um, uh, and, and, and I think uh, would, would have uh, really probably recoiled, I certainly wouldn't want to speak, with, speak for her, but sure. I think would have recoiled at the idea that what she was doing was undermining um, principles of the American founding. I, th I think she really genuinely thought she was vindicating important principles. Uh, of the American political and legal experiment. I, that's consistent with everything that I've seen on her. And of course, I, being somewhat of an originalist and a constitutionalist myself, I wound up disagreeing with her quite a bit. But at the same time, whenever I was watching her and, and she would say things like talking about her own confirmation process and how uh, that was handled well from people on the right and, and how she talked about the rule of law and the importance of everybody adhering to it. Now, her view of what the law ought to be may have been different than mine, but she did certainly believe in that. So just along those same kinds of lines, though, and, and just sort of with all of that in with all of that basis to go off of, if President Trump were to replace her and nominate somebody that is an originalist, somebody that is a consistent constitutionalist and a textualist, uh, how would that change the makeup of the court as it stands today if we get a judge like that in there to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Oh, I think there's no question that it is going to be a, a, a significant net gain for the rule of law. Um, and for those of us who care about um, the rule of law and who, who care about uh, the rule of the Constitution, um, and that uh, laws should be applied uh, as according to their original intent and their original public meaning, um, uh, that, that, that's going to be a significant improvement. And, and we should observe that everyone on now all three of President Trump's lists mm -hmm. um, are excellent, excellent jurists on this score um, in different ways. Um, and, they, you know, they have different backgrounds and different training and different strengths. Uh, but they all have um, demonstrated a commitment to the rule of law. And I think uh, anyone on, on any of his lists um, would, be, would be a significant improvement over Justice Ginsburg's jurisprudence. And we ought to give credit where credit is due for that. Um, there are the, the, the institution, of course, that has had the, played the strongest role um, in lining up judges for judicial appointment by this White House, of course, is the Federalist Society. Right. Um, which was founded, uh, you know, some decades ago in order to bring more intellectual diversity to the legal academy and to the legal profession. Um, uh, and then, of course, institutions, uh, law schools uh, such as my own uh, uh, and, and the law school from which I graduated, the University of Notre Dame, where founding principles and original understandings of law are still taught. Jurisprudence is still taught. Mm -hmm. um, of course, famously, one of the two women who've been named as being at the top of President Trump's shortlist, uh, Amy, Amy Coney Barrett, right. uh, both graduated from Notre Dame. Uh, she actually graduated from there a few, a few months before I started there and then later taught there. 
Um, and then Alliance Defending Freedom and their Blackstone Fellowship and other organizations that have done a really good job of rehabilitating these, these ideas. Yeah, actually, since you brought that up, I didn't plan for the interview to go in this direction, but since you brought it up, we're, we're going to talk about it. Uh, you know, you are a member of the very scary religious cult known as the Catholic Church, and I just wanted you to address that for a second because I know that I, I've been reading things about Amy Comey Barrett and uh, her religious faith and that she believes a lot of horrible radical things like that they should give a certain amount of their income to the church and that women should be submissive to their husbands. And I mean, reading some of these hit pieces on Judge Barrett, uh, you would think that she was, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, robe wearing paganist cult uh, that she's she belongs to. So could you speak to a little bit of that and, and maybe a little bit of uh, Justice Barrett herself? Yeah, well, I should uh, start by clarifying uh, a misconception, perhaps. Uh, I'm, I am Catholic in the small C sense, but I'm not Roman Catholic. Um, I'm actually a member of the Anglican Communion. Um, but I did study at Notre Dame Law School. I have a number of very good friends um, mm -hmm. in the academy who are Roman Catholic. Um, and my work is primarily in uh, taking the insights of what's known as the natural law tradition of thinking about the idea that there are objective, critical standards of morality that we can all know through the exercise of reason. That's a tradition that is not particularly Catholic. Many Anglicans have been great expositors of it, such Richard Hooker and C.S. Lewis, mm -hmm. um, and many evangelicals as well. Um, right. But, uh, but of course, it was, it's been cultivated by the Roman Catholic Church. Barrett is very much formed in that same tradition. Um, we had all the same professors at Notre Dame. Um, we just barely right. missed each other. We've been mentored by many of the same people. Um, and there's nothing mystical about it. If you want to figure out what these folks believe, you can go read their, uh, their public essays and their law review articles and, and, uh, and, and see for yourself. And what you'll find actually is what they are saying is basically the same thing as uh, that which folks like Martin Luther King Jr. have said and right. Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and, of course, the framers of... Uh, of the American founding, the, right, the, the three authors of the Declaration of Independence, the Northwest Territories Act. This is very much in the center of the American legal and constitutional tradition. The idea that there are objective right and wrongs, um, not many of them on most questions, reasonable minds can disagree, but there are certain objective rights and wrongs. And there are certain guiding principles, which when settled and specified as laws and particularly as constitutional laws, um, we must, consistent with reason, preserve them. The right to a jury trial, mm -hmm. the right to bear arms, um, the, the particular due process guarantees that we've inherited uh, in our common law tradition, the right to confront witnesses, the right to have notice of charges against us and all these sorts of things. Um, and we throw these legal securities for our rights overboard at our peril. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are other complications. Now that the court has, in fact, spent the last 50 years or so going wrong on important constitutional legal questions, what do you do with those precedents? Uh, there's a doctrine called stare decisis, which says, right. usually what you do is you follow the, the precedents uh, of the court. And Justice Barrett, Judge Barrett, I'm sorry. <laughs> Potentially <laughs> Justice Barrett. Yeah, yeah. Um, Judge Barrett um, has thought a lot about this question. Um, this tension between an original understanding of the Constitution and adherence to the rule of law on one hand um, and the doctrine of stare decisis, which might motivate the court to uh, maintain flawed precedents mm -hmm. um, on the other. She's written quite a lot about it in her scholarship. She has written really with, uh, with deep, deep reflection and, and very nuanced critical reflections on these on the, the ha really hard questions at the at the juncture of this tension. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and really uh, has, a, has demonstrated that she has a very, very well-formed juridical mind um, and I think is, uh, is an excellent judge. So sort of on that, because I, I think when going back to the issue of their faith, uh, first of all, I think that that's sort of a, uh, a testament to how far we've moved on the Overton window, that there's such a secularization in this country that a lot of people, journalists and, and those types, can look at the beliefs of, of that in saying things that submitting to your husband or tithing are radical and outside the religious mainstream, when, of course, uh, Catholics, Protestants, I mean, bas basically every flavor of Christianity, as it were, believes a lot of those basic things. Uh, but also, 
and I think that this is equally important, uh, I think that there is a misconception that because you are a Christian and because you have deeply held religious beliefs, that you are incapable of making a distinction between what your religion dictates you do personally and what the law mandates you do. Because I think, and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on this, it seems like to a lot to the left, kind of what you were talking about with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if she personally believes it, that's the way the law ought to read. And that's very different than somebody that is an originalist or a constitutionalist who can look at their own religion and say, okay, my religion teaches this is wrong, but the law says this, therefore that's going to be my opinion. And so could you speak to that for just a second? Yeah, that's, that's very well said, and you're absolutely right. There, unfortunately, there's a bit of an asymmetry that we're witnessing right now. And that is um, those of us who believe in an original understanding of the Constitution and the rule of law, we can perfectly well understand the perspective of our friends on the left. We know why they're freaking out. We know why they're upset. We know why they're worried. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is that they're concerned that the precedents which the court has handed down um, creating these uh, these new doctrines and, and abrogating uh, uh, fundamental rights like the, the, the right of the unborn to life and right. legal securities for the health of the mother and the rights of children to be connected to their natural parents. Um, they're concerned that all of those are going to be rolled back. And you're absolutely right that from their perspective, the law or what justice requires is identical to what I believe. Right. Um, and the asymmetry is they can't perceive that we don't view the law that way. We really do believe in things like um, the rule of law, that the law should be applied to a case, even when the result is one that I don't like. That, that's actually, I think that's actually the test of a good judge. Uh, does a judge yeah. occasionally uh, compelled by the law to reach uh, decisions that uh, uh, results in their decisions that they don't like, because that's what the law requires of them. Um, and, and stare decisis. We really do take stare decisis seriously, because we really uh, uh, value the, uh, the the role and power of the court, not judicial supremacy, by the way. That's a different right. that's a different predicate that the left believes in that many of us, well, unfortunately, many people on the right also uh, accept it, but many of us on the, <laughs> on the right who care about the rule of law um, uh, see clearly that that's not a, a correct understanding of the Constitution. Uh, but they don't see any of that. And so what they see is a zero-sum contest over power. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is... Uh, you know, for, for obvious reasons, fairly disconcerting to our friends on the left. Um, uh, and um, and that's, you know, that's, of course, not what Judge Barrett is about. That's not what uh, Judge Lagoa, who is another uh, uh, p potential candidate for this seat, um, is all about. These, these, these ladies and the other folks on the list are genuinely committed to the rule of law, and they have no desire to impose their own um, particular religious tradition or uh, religious um, practices or um, peculiarly religious beliefs on the rest of America. One thing that I wanted to ask about that you touched on briefly just now, you were talking, of course, about the issue of life and, and sort of the repercussions of having a justice that disagrees with the views of the left on this. And I have seen so much panic on the left about Roe v. Wade being overturned, which, let me be clear, I would love to see. I'm, I'm very much a, of the opinion that Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided and that the unborn should be legally protected. However, personally, just based on my perception of it, even if we got somebody that is staunchly pro-life and 100% willing to overturn Roe, I don't see that happening with this court. Uh, because of some of the things that we've seen from Justice Kavanaugh, because of what we've seen from Chief Justice Roberts, I, I just personally do not think that even if we got a pro-life judge on there, that that would make a difference. Uh, am I wrong on that? Am I somewhere in the ballpark of being correct? And, you know, where would you see that vote going if it were taken today? I know that's hard to ask you to predict, but just uh, what would you what would you predict would be the, the case? Yeah, well, I wouldn't want to speculate on what this court might do in the abstract. I will say that if given a really good test case, um, the court might very well begin not to overrule Roe right away, but begin to overrule some of the later abortion precedents, um, which continue to extend Roe and expand the rights of abortionists and expand the powers and immunities of abortionists in a way um, that, in, that in some senses 
uh, really undermine the original rationale of Roe. Mm -hmm. Roe is supposed to be a protection for women's choice and women's autonomy. Um, and what the Roe, Casey, uh, Singleton versus Wolf, Hellstedt versus Whole Women's Health line of precedence uh, has revealed is that it's actually not about that. Certainly not about that anymore, if it ever was about that. It's all about the power of abortionists. Um, and and uh, I think we're, we're the court confronted with the tension between the powers and special privileges that have been conferred upon abortionists and the life and the health of the mother and her child, um, I think uh, we could expect to see those precedents begin to be rolled back um, mm -hmm. incrementally, not overnight. The, the, the pro-life cause has gotten better over the years in, in um, crafting legislation and in uh, crafting test cases that um, are sympathetic and, uh, and really difficult for the court to ignore. Um, it's, it's hard to say whether they're there yet in terms of presenting to the court uh, a, really, a really slam dunk challenge. Uh, one thing that's sort of low hanging fruit um, uh, is, uh, which I've been saying for some time, is the pro-life cause ought to be challenging the standing of abortionists. That's the power to bring a suit in court. Notice um, every time there's one of these challenges to a state law, it's not a pregnant woman who's bringing the claim. It's an abortionist, a mm -hmm. big corporation or an abortionist, usually a man who has a lot of money at stake and somehow they're allowed to speak on behalf of their putative patients to strike down laws which are put there to protect the health of the mother. Right. To protect these very same women on, for whom they, we don't allow abusive husbands to speak on behalf of their, their, their victims in court. We don't allow, you know, we have confidentiality protections for, for clergy and lawyers. We don't allow um, abusive clergies or lawyers to speak on behalf of their victims in court. But we allow the abortion industry. So that's that's low hanging fruit. And there are other examples I could give. Um, but it's up to the uh, pro-life advocates to craft those cases in such a way. Go on offense, start prosecuting, bring out the fact that these Douglas Carpins um, and Kers Kermit Gosnells and mm -hmm. and uh, the Klopfers of the world um, are, are not actually aberrations. But that's that's the that's the inherent logic of the whole Roe Hellerstedt line of precedent. Is you 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 have uh, you have basically caused these abortionists to lose their respect for life and health of the human being standing in front of them. Um, tell that story in a better way. Yeah, I I think that if nothing else, we've gotten significantly better on the optics of that from the public perspective too. From the legal perspective, that's kind of the the edge that you were, or sorry, the the side of it that you were showing. Um, but before we do go, because I know that our our time is starting to run short. If you were advising the president right now on who he should pick, and you don't have to give specific names, but just uh, what type of judge would you be looking for? What are some of the uh, uh, what are some of the signs of a judge that you would want to sit on this seat in the Supreme Court? Well, I would want um, two virtues that are very closely related uh, to be demonstrated by this judge. Uh, I would want this judge to have demonstrated intellectual courage and moral courage. Um, so I want to see uh, a judge who has already shown that they can resist the significant cultural and social pressure which exists inside the echo chamber, inside the Beltway in DC, um, and is not going to be seduced by um, the opportunities for accolades and approbation uh, of the cultural elite, um, and is going to do the right thing and make the right decision. So I want to see moral courage in this judge. Um, and I want to see intellectual courage. I want to see someone who's thought deeply and carefully about um, the important legal questions uh, and jurisprudential questions that this next justice is going to have to confront during his or her time on the court. Um, I would like to see some evidence that this judge has given careful reflection to the question, what is law in fact? Mm -hmm. um, why is it that precedents matter? Is it that those are the laws or is it they are evidence of the law? And if they're not good evidence of the law, what do we do with bad precedents? Um, you know, how do we interpret uh, text? Is it just the text uh, as some of our friends think? Is it, um, well, judges should be, should be pushing the boundaries and making the, the text mean whatever they want? Or is there really a set of propositions which we can say constitutes the intents and purposes of the crafters of law, which we, which we should respect because it reflects 
careful deliberation, sometimes centuries of careful deliberation about what sorts of rules uh, make society flourish and, um, and go well. Um, I wanna see careful, careful reflection, evidence of careful reflection on those sorts of questions uh, so that I know whoever's going into this seat um, is not going to be trying to make it up on the fly, um, but is going to be acting out of their own uh, well-formed conscience and, and, and very carefully um, uh, uh, thought through convictions about the relationship between law and judgment. Now, I don't know if you've had time to look over all of the people on Trump court list, but would you say that the, the people that you know of so far would meet that? Because I think he's been talking about, what, four, four women that he's uh, brought forward and, and discussed as possibly being his nominee? Yeah, and uh, the two that, of course, have emerged as sort of the top contenders, um, again, are Judge Barrett on the Seventh Circuit and Judge Lagoa um, on the 11th. I have mm -hmm. um, some familiarity, not with, uh, not personally with um, the other judges, uh, uh, the other female judges uh, on his shortlist, uh, although I know um, some of the judges on, on the shortlist. Um, uh, but they all have demonstrated a real commitment to the rule of law in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, many of them uh, have gone through various educational programs like the Blackstone Fellowship at ADF, uh, where these sorts of big picture questions are asked. Others like Judge Lagoa have really paid their dues as a judge, in her case, uh, in the Florida State Judiciary, sort of working her way up through um, and has shown that she's a very, very competent technician of the law um, and is really committed to applying the law to the cases in front of her. Um, uh, and so there's, you know, it's an embarrassment of riches for those of us who care about the rule of law. The, the bench, uh, so to speak, is very, very deep. Um, and I have every confidence that uh, if this president does get to appoint um, Justice Ginsburg's successor, uh, we're going to be a lot better off as a result. Well, I, I got to tell you, your evaluation there makes me feel better because I know that from people that are of a conservative bend, the fear is always that you're going to get a Justice Roberts uh, or, you know, a, even a Justice Kennedy um, somebody that, because I, I, I believe that the strategy from Republicans has been uh, well intended, but not well executed, that we kind of try to go with these stealth, if you will, uh, sort of candidates and, and try to <laughs> make it to where um, when, when they put them in, they basically don't have a record. And, and that's dangerous. And, and what you're talking about is somebody that has already shown that sort of moral courage to uh, stand against the the tide or the whims of, you know, whatever is popular politically at the time. And, uh, you know, that that would be the thing that I'm looking for. And uh, that would that would be the thing I'm looking for, too, and, and hope that they would be able to do that. So uh, really do appreciate that evaluation. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with before we uh, wrap it up here? Yeah, regardless what happens in the next few weeks, regardless of the outcome of the election, um, the, the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary on the whole uh, are really much, much stronger than they were four years ago. Um, and I, I think for that, we can be grateful. And I think we can be grateful for the life and example of, uh, of Justice, the late Justice Ginsburg in many respects. Mm -hmm. She demonstrated what uh, charity looks like and friendship looks like. Um, and overall, uh, what's what, what, what uh, people are capable of when they set their mind in a single-minded uh, uh, single way uh, toward achieving excellence in their craft. All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Adam McLeod, a professor of law here at Faulkner, one of our very own. Thank you so much for being on the program, and uh, hopefully we'll get to hear from you soon. Thanks for having me. People ask me all the time, Caleb, how do you stay in such great shape? Well, let me tell you, it's not easy. The Secret is a steady diet consisting mostly of likes and subscriptions, especially the ones where the person hits the notification bell. That's what actually gives me my superhuman strength. Likes, as it turns out, are very high in protein and iron. Sadly, doesn't do anything for your hair.